Welcome to the Intro to Market Simulations and Theory webinar, hosted by your friends at Satu Software. My name is Megan Pites, and I'm the Ingenuity Ambassador at Satu Software. Today, Keith Shun, the Senior Vice President of Satu Analytics, will be leading this webinar. Keith has nearly 30 years of marketing science experience, and many of you have seen him present at the Satu Software Conference, the Art Forum, and many other industry events. He has a lot of exciting information to share with you today, and so I'm going to turn it over to him now. Take it away, Keith. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, sharing part of your morning with us here. Um, so we're gonna talk about, this is the first of, I think, three presentations that we've got planned in the next couple of weeks on market simulation. So this is sort of an introduction. What are simulations? Why do we do them? Uh, what role do they play in forecasting? How can we do them better? Uh, that's the topics today. So we'll talk, uh, we'll spend most of the time talking about sort of introducing the mechanics of simulations, how they work exactly, what the math is behind them, and what some of the theory is. Um, we'll talk about, and then toward the end, we'll talk about uh, the gaps that separate the preference shares that we get out of our simulations and market shares that happen out there in the world. We'll talk about how our simulators are just one component, uh, potentially, of much larger forecasting systems, and we'll talk about ways of improving the accuracy of the forecasts that we get from our simulators. So why do we do them? Well, first off, we think they, rep they, they, they reflect real-world behavior. Because we're typically simulating at the individual respondent level, we can capture the fact that you're not the same as your neighbor, that, that no one respondent is exactly the same as, as any other respondent. They have their own tastes and preferences, and we can capture all of that in the simulator. So we don't have to uh, find ourselves trying to produce the product that appeals to the average respondent or the average consumer, uh, if only because such an average may not exist. So we, we, we get to take advantage of all of the, the, uh, the interesting differences that, that occur in people. Moreover, uh, we could view simulators as being sort of a choice laboratory. We, we collect our conjoint data and then we can run all sorts of what if uh, scenarios and find out well what happens if we do this and what happens if our if our if our uh, you know our competitors respond with that um, what if we launch this new product or what if we price it this way or add that other feature uh, all of those things we can answer with uh, with simulators and the neat thing for me uh, has always been that the answers the results that we get out of a simulator make sense to business managers now. Uh, I don't know how often you've gone to a, a business manager or a vice president of marketing and said, oh, something has a utility of uh, minus 0.4, but that's really good because it could have had a utility of minus 0.77. That audience just doesn't know what we mean with those terms. But if we start talking in shares and we say, you know, if, 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 we, if, 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 we, if we do this strategy, you know, our share is 42%, but if we do this other strategy, our share is only 18%, that means something. That that uh, that speaks in a common language. If we just did our conjoint study and looked at our utilities and importances, that's kind of informative. It, it sort of tells us things, but average utilities don't tell the whole story. In fact, uh, they're sometimes the subject of, of what's called a fallacy of division, and I'll show you an example of that in just a couple minutes. Another reason that we do them is they help us answer strategic questions, like I just mentioned. So, you know, at what price, if, what price increase uh, can we make that where we start to see people switch to a competitor? So we want to avoid that that size of an increase. Um, is there a way to modify the, our products so that we can reduce cost while simultaneously maintaining share? If we're going to launch a new product in the market, should be a high-end product or a budget model, or maybe there's room in our portfolio for both. Or do we have to worry about that new product launch cannibalizing our own sales? Those are all the kind of questions that we can answer with a simulator. So I talked a minute ago about the fallacy of division that happens sometimes. So let, let's look at just this slide here. What is the, what, what's the favorite color of this sample of people? Well, there's a couple ways of looking at it. You could look and say, well, red has the highest average utility. Red must be the most popular color for this sample. On the other hand, if, if we look at if we if we if we look at how many people actually prefer red, we find out that 
No one does. Res respondents number one and three preferred blue. Respondent number two preferred yellow. And even though red has the highest average utility, it gets a zero market share from these three people. So that, that's what's called a fallacy of division. We're assuming that what applies to the sample as a whole, the fact that, it, that red has the highest utility, applies to the people within the sample as well, when in fact it doesn't. So simulator allows us to avoid that kind of fallacy if we, if we build it with individual respondent level data. Uh, competitive effects. So let's assume that 80% of the market prefers round widgets and 20% of the market prefers square widgets. Which, which product should we take to market? Well, if, if this is all we knew about the market, maybe we might think that uh, we ought to produce some round widgets because we'd be satisfying 80% of the customers if we could only produce one. That would be a logical thing to do. But if we knew more about the competitive landscape, maybe we'd learn that all the other competitors are already producing round widgets and nobody is producing square widgets, so there's a niche available in the market for us. And again, when we build a simulator, if we include competitors and, and their actions and their products, we can, we, can, we can learn this sort of information. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about um, how to do, a, what, what the mechanics are for a, sim, for a simulation, how we actually go about doing it. So to do this, we need some utilities. So let's, let's, let's say we've done a conjoint study of ice cream cones and we've collected data for 500 respondents. We've run our, our, our utility model and here's the utilities that we have for each, uh, for each of our 500 people. We're only showing respondent number one, two, and 500 here. But you can see that respondent one, for instance, likes uh, vanilla a little bit more than chocolate. Uh, she has a higher utility for vanilla than for chocolate. And she's a rational decision maker. She'd rather pay less for her ice cream cone than, than more. Uh, respondent number two, for uh, example, also likes, ch uh, likes, chocolate, uh, less, uh, likes chocolate more than vanilla. And again, is, is a rational decision maker because uh, she cares more about uh, lower prices and so on. So we've got a full set of utilities here. Now, what a simulator does is it does one of a few different sorts of math. So we're, we'll talk about the first one first. It's called the first choice rule. It's also called the maximum utility rule. There's also something called the logic probability rule and randomized first choice. And we'll go through these three mechanisms for doing simulations in turn. So first choice, as the name uh, suggests, uh, everybody picks, we, we assume that everybody picks their first choice product. That if, if my utility is highest for a product, for one product than it is for the others, then I'll, I'll choose that high utility product, the one that's highest for me. And we assume that for everybody. So essentially, everybody's going to make a vote. They're gonna, we're we're going to assign them uh, their vote to the product that has the highest utility for them. We're going to count that up across respondents, and we're going to say that's preference share. And notice we're not calling them market shares for reasons we're going to talk about uh, later. So here's how it would work in our simulation example. Let's say we want to build a market where a 25 cent chocolate cone competes with a 35 cent vanilla cone. So all we do is we have to sum the utilities, right? Because this is an added, our utility models tend to be additive utility models. So for the first respondent, we sum her utility of uh, point, uh, 0.18 for chocolate and point, or, I'm sorry, 1.8 for chocolate and 5.3 for 25 cents to get a total utility for that 25 cent chocolate cone of 7.1. And similarly, uh, this respondent's utility for the 35 cent vanilla cone is 2.5 for vanilla plus 3.2 for 35 cents is 5.7. And we'd say the highest utility uh, product of those two for respondent one is the chocolate cone. And so we're going to say this respondent votes chocolate. Uh, the second respondent likewise has a utility of uh, 2.2 for the chocolate cone minus 0.3 for the vanilla cone. So we say Again, we're going to predict that this person goes with the 25 cent chocolate cone. We do that for all 500 respondents. And finally, out at respondent number 500, we've got a, a vanilla vote there. So if we counted all these votes up across our 500 respondents, we'd come up with something like this. We'd say we might, we might have found that 65% of the people, almost two thirds of the sample, likes the, prefers the chocolate 25 cent cone over the vanilla 35 cent cone. That's a simulation. That's it. All, we, all we've done is count people's votes. We added utilities. 
we said everybody picks the highest utility product for them and that's done. We have to wonder a little bit, I mean, this is a really easy model to do, right? All we do is some addition, we look at, we look for which one's the maximum and we, we call it the winner for each respondent. Um, <clears throat> sometimes this can oversimplify consumer behavior, right? Because a lot of us don't always, you know, a product that has just over, just barely preferred over another, we say it gets 100% of the vote. So maybe one of them has a utility of 6.2 and one of another, another product has a utility of 6.199, almost a tie, but because the one just barely wins, we say it's the winner. So we learn which product's preferred, but we don't know anything about the, the relative preferences of the options that aren't preferred either. So there, there, there's a little bit of unrealism about this sometimes. When should we use it? Despite those theoretical problems, there are certain conditions in, in which we'd expect first choice would work quite well. If we've got a large sample size, uh, the nice thing about a large sample size is we've got a lot of those near situations where it's almost 50-50 or it's, you know, the 6.2 utility versus 6.199. Uh, if we had a small number of respondents, it wouldn't take too many of those near ties to, to really move the shares quite a bit. If we have a large number of respondents, we can benefit from the, the law of large numbers and realize that about half the times when it's almost a tie, it's going to fall the one way, and about half the time it's probably going to fall the other way, and we'll probably be okay. Another reason that might make us want to use the, uh, the first choice model is that the reality we're trying to model really is first choice. There are certain decisions that we make as a consumers that wherein we're only buying one product. So large ticket items that are bought infrequently, say a refrigerator or an automobile or a house, those might be situations where first choice simulation really is the most realistic because it represents the choice that people are making. Now, if those were automobile purchases made by a corporate fleet buyer who's buying 50 cars a week, probably wouldn't be realistic to do first choice because it could well be that that person isn't buying the exact same make and model of his car on all, for all 50 of those purchases each week. So we might want to find a way of spreading it out a little bit. We say that consumers are uh, unpredictable because we usually don't we don't usually predict uh, purchase with 100% certainty the, the product that has the highest utility for us. So, for, and, and some, there's some reasons for this, right? I mean, there's some good reasons and some, some reasons we'd rather not have. For, for one thing, there's, there's error present. Whenever you run a statistical model, you get some utilities and you get some standard errors around those utilities. There's some uncertainty in the model building process itself. Um, add to that that there's some uncertainty in the respondent choices, the people taking our Taking our surveys, uh, taking our surveys, they, they answer, they make their choices. They do that with some amount of error. I mean, maybe they're being inattentive, or uh, but even if even if they're paying perfectly close attention to our survey, we know that like other survey measures, uh, there's only a certain amount of reliability to our conjoint experiments. So if you gave the same respondent the same choices the next day, they wouldn't give you all the same answers. There's some random behavior that occurs. There's other. There's all sorts of unaccounted for influences, right, that, that happen uh, when people make choices. And then there's variety seeking, right? So, so maybe, maybe I just like to spread my choices around a little bit. And so we might want to reflect those kinds of things in our simulator. So here's what we might like to have. So if we had a first, see so if you can see down in the green there, if we had a first choice, uh, simulation, we, we would say product B wins 100% of the time, but that might not be realistic if this is a product category, um, well, for one thing, if it's a product category where people buy multiples of, like breakfast cereal. Uh, if you've got a household full of people, uh, you might be buying different breakfast cereals for different people, and in fact, different cereals for different people on different days. But even if you didn't have that, you, you might want to recognize that any one person's choices uh, are a little bit uncertain, and, and rather than say there's a 100% chance that uh, Jones is going to pick product B, we might, we might want to say, well, he's probably going to pick product B, but we want to leave some, some possibility that we might be wrong, that, that you know, C does appeal to him a little bit and, and A appeals to him a little bit. Maybe we should spread that person's share a little bit and kind of hedge our bets. So how do we do that? We move on to the next simulation method. It's called the logit rule, or share of preference. And this is a model that's a, this is a, this is a, 
uh, simulation model that's available to us when our utilities have been estimated using some sort of logit model. So an aggregate logit model or a, uh, a hierarchical Bayes logit model or a, a latent class logit model. Because the way the logit model works is, you see, it, <clears throat> you see an equation here. The logit model uses this equation to compute the utilities, so conveniently we can plug the utilities back into it to estimate uh, probabilities of purchase or of, of, of preference, of choice. And so, the, the, uh, the, so all we do really is we take the utility of a given alternative that we've got and we exponentiate it. That's what that exp is there. That's the Excel function for exponentiation. It's also called the anti-log. It's, uh, it's taking the, the, uh, the mathematical constant epsilon, 2.71, uh, e, 2.71, uh, 8.3 and so on, to the power of your utility. So we're going to take, two, we're gonna take the, the root of the natural log system, that e, uh, to the utility of a power in the numerator, and then in the denominator, we're going to sum the exponentiated utilities of options A, B, and C. And the result of that, that ratio is going to be the share. So let's walk through a mathematical example here. Let's say we've got three alternatives with the following utilities. Uh, alternative A has a utility of 0.75, B has a utility of 0, and C has a utility of minus 1.25. So if we want to estimate the share of A, we just exponentiate that 0.75, which turns out to be 2.117. And then we divide it by the sum of the exponent, uh, exponentiations of 0.75, uh, 0, and minus 1.25. And you can see that, you can see in the second line in green down there, we've got the, those turn out to be 2.117, again, the exponentiation of 0.75. The anti-log of 0 is 1, the anti-log of minus 1.25 is 2.87, and so we end up with a, a share prediction for product A of 62.2%. If we were doing this for product C, we would have had the exponent of minus 1.25 in the numerator, the same denominator, and we'd have had a much lower share. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the math of the logit choice rule. And we can use it anytime we've got logit-based utilities. We could use it, and people used to use it back in the old days when they had utilities from other mathematical models, other statistical models, but uh, that wasn't really valid to do because those utilities weren't estimated with logit. Now, logit, all would be fine with the world if, uh, if the logit model was, was accurate under all conditions, but it's not. It has, a, it has an unfortunate property called the independence of irrelevant alternatives. Now, this isn't a property that, that, that mean people put in logit. It's just uh, when, 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 lo when the logit model was being derived, uh, this, this property was necessary to get the math to work. And what it states is that the, the ratio between any two alternative shares, any al two alternatives shares, should be independent of all the other alternatives. That's independent of what's in the other alternatives, what their utilities are, whether they're absent or present. So it's independent really means independent. So the ratio of any two alternative shares should be a constant. Now this also implies constant substitution rates, which it turns out is pretty easy to show as unrealistic. And I'll get back to the red bus and the blue bus here. This property was first discovered and talked about in the transportation literature. So I won't use red buses and blue buses in the next problem, but in, in the example here, but that, that's where the terminology comes from. So let's say we've got a market and there's two drink products on the market, Pepsi and milk, and they have the following logit utilities. Pepsi has a utility of 1.0 and milk has a utility of 2.0. So using that logit choice rule we just talked about, we can get the share of Pepsi as the anti-log of 1 over the sum of the anti-logs of 1 and 2. Uh, that's 2.72 over uh, 2.72 plus 7.39 is 26.9% uh, share. So the share of Pepsi is, 20, is almost 27%. By the same kind of math, the share of milk is 73%. So now we've got a market where milk is about three quarters of the market and Pepsi is about a quarter of the market. Now we're going to introduce a new product to the market. A new product's called Coke. And like Pepsi, it has a utility of 1.0. Now, before you look at the rest of the slide, what would you think is going to happen if Coke enters this market? Is Coke going to take a lot of share from Pepsi? Is it going to take a lot of share from milk? Is it going to take share equally from both, disproportionately in some way? I, I think our expectation, knowing what we know about Pepsi and Coke and milk, 
is that Coke will take share disproportionately from Pepsi. So let's see if that's what happens. So now we compute our, we, we use our logic choice rule here. Uh, we compute, the, we've got the utilities for Pepsi, Coke, and milk, and the Pepsi share turns out to be 21. The milk share turns out to be 58, and the Coke share is 21. You can see that Coke and Pepsi have the same share, which isn't too much of a surprise because they both have utilities of 1.0, but where did most of Coke's share come from? Well, it only took five of its 21 share points from Pepsi, and it took the other 16 share points from milk, so it stole disproportion it, it stole more than you'd have expected from milk. And so here's what happens. It didn't take share equally from them. It took them in proportion to their shares. So three, since milk, before the introduction of Coke, milk had almost three quarters of the market. When Coke comes in, it takes about three quarters of its volume from milk. And you can see that you've got the original share there, the new shares, both Pepsi and milk lost 21.19% of their share. Not share points, but 21.19% of their share. So that's a bit of a problem. We really would have liked a model that took disproportionately from Pepsi uh, and, and not nearly so much from milk. So that's a problem with the IIA, the IIA property. It's a problem that that property causes the logit model. Now that, 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 that's not always a, a huge problem anymore because what we found is that if we use latent class or especially HB modeling for our utilities and we're able to accommodate heterogeneity, a lot of that red bus, blue bus problem kind of goes away. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Uh, and that's because similar products tend to compete more closely with one another and we don't have the problem that uh, Pepsi and Milk have really similar utilities for each individual respondent. And, and we might see that uh, while Pepsi and Coke had similar utilities, milk has a very different one, and those two are more, more in comp competition with each other. Another thing we can do, other than you know, account for respondent heterogeneity, is we could use a simulation method that directly assesses uh, product similarities and that penalizes two products or that causes products to take share more from each other when they're similar. And, a, a, and the, the third of the simulation technologies that we're, uh, we're talking about today, we talked about the, the first choice, we talked about the logit rule. This is the third one. It's called randomized first choice. It sort of sits in the middle ground between logit and first choice. Uh, we can use it with aggregate or disaggregate utilities. What it does is it splits shares in a way that reflects more, more accurately substitution effects for similar products. Does it more accurately than the logit rule does. So let's let's look at that. Remember we had a market. Remember how our market simulator worked before, right? We we had uh, for our first choice rule, we had each person make one. Each person got one vote, so it was one person, one vote. Randomized first choice is going to be a little bit different. We're, let's let's say we let's say we want to we set we would want to do it ten thousand iterations. What we would do is we would tur turn each respondent into 10,000 different votes. We would say there's 10,000 different opportunities I have to vote, or respondent one here has to vote, and we're going to, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give him those 10,000 opportunities, and some of the times he's gonna choose chocolate, and some of the times he's gonna choose vanilla, but then we're gonna, we're, we're gonna have a split vote for each person, and the way we do that is we add a little, we, we add a theoretically amount of, uh, appropriate amount of error to each of the estimates. So uh, for, for respondent one, we're gonna, you know, we, we've randomly chosen an amount of error that's 0 0.015 to add to that person's score for vanilla. And we're gonna, we're gonna subtract minus 0.75, that's, the, that's the, the amount of random, um, that's the amount of the random error that we're gonna assign to chocolate for, for, the, for this first iteration for respondent one. And, and so on for the, the amounts of random error that we're gonna add for, uh, the three price points. And if we, so if we did a simulation now for just the first iteration of respondent one, where it says iteration one. So iteration one, again, is just the, the, the respondent's actual utilities perturbed by some small amount of random error. And so we've assigned these random errors in iteration one. And given the, those errors, the, the chocolate utility is 6.55, the vanilla utility is 4.385, we say chocolate's the winner for iteration one. 
Then in iteration two, we again ran the, we again sample from those error distributions and we assign a little bit of error to uh, vanilla and a little bit to chocolate and a little bit to each of the price points. So we come up with a second vote and a third vote all the way through. You can see here response iteration 10,000. So now in iteration 10,000, vanillas the amount of error we add to vanilla is 1.5. Uh, the amount of error that we uh, we add to the, the 0.5 price point is minus 0.14 and so on. And we get two total utilities and we say that this person votes for, you know, in iteration 10,000, uh, this respondent uh, chooses vanilla. So now each respondent's become 10,000 respondents and we can, we, we can for, each, for each one person, we don't have one vote anymore. So this particular respondent one might have been 88% chocolate and 12% vanilla. And respondent two might have been 27% chocolate and 73% vanilla and so on. So we've got these, these shares now that we can average across our entire sample and that becomes uh, our simulation. The neat thing is that the, there's a, the way this corrects for similarity is, let's say we had two chocolate cones on the market. Let's say we our simulation had a 35 cent chocolate and a 25 cent chocolate and a 35 cent vanilla or whatever, a 50 cent chocolate maybe, and a 25 cent chocolate. When we're adding the utilities for those for, for each chocolate cone, uh, each one of them for, for iteration one, chocolate is gonna be 1.05, that's 1.8 minus 0.75 for both of those simulated chocolate cones. So those two, sim so, so the two chocolates, because they're chocolate, not only get the same uh, utility, they're gonna get that, that same amount of random error too. So those two are gonna tend to move together. They're gonna tend to be more similar and draw share from one another more uh, than the vanilla cone is because those errors move in tandem. Now that can be a little bit of a problem uh, you know, we don't want to penalize things necessarily for having similar prices. You don't want to give something uh, a benefit because it has a different price because one of the price, if two products have different prices, one is higher and one is lower, and we don't want to give the higher price product an additional benefit because it's different from the lower price product. So this product uh, correction for similarity that's, that's pot that we do with randomized first choice is something we tend to turn off uh, when it comes to price. Another, another potential problem for randomized first choice is that if you're simulating a large, large market, say 20, 20 or more products, sometimes the shares become so small that that random component that we put in with randomized first choice uh, kind of swamps the utilities themselves and, and we're just adding a lot more error than we should. So that's another thing to watch out for with randomized first choice is to be careful if you're, doing, if you're simulating a large number of products in, in a single market. Okay, so we've got a couple, Sawtooth Software has a couple of different simulators. One is built into our Lighthouse 9 uh, product. It's called the Choice Simulator. It's, a, it's a, a relatively new product, just come out in the last couple of months. It's also available as a standalone that you could take your utilities, load them in there. It, it's a nice little uh, program that runs on your desktop. We also have an online simulator. It's a web-based simulator, a sort of a, <clears throat> that you can access through the web. Basically, you, you take your utilities, you upload them to your web-based simulator, you, uh, you, know, you can put segment data or whatever else you want in there. So th those are two things you can do. I know a lot of, I, I would say probably two-thirds of the time that I make simulators for clients, it's, it's one of those two. But a third of the time, my clients really, uh, some clients really want Excel simulators. Uh, they're, they're easier to distribute. Sometimes it's a little bit more transparent how they're working. So you can certainly, uh, using the math that we've talked about above there, build your own simulator in Excel. And until very recently, uh, the next sentence out of my mouth would have been, but of course, if you want to do randomized first choice, you really don't have that Excel option uh, because that's something that's only in our software. It would be virtually, it would be extremely difficult to program in Excel. Um, I don't think that's true anymore because our choice simulator uh, product that's built into Lighthouse 9, uh, exports Excel simulators. So it, if, if you build your simulator in that, you can export to Excel and you can even Excel ran, you can even export randomized first choice to an Excel simulator. So that's really, that's pretty cool stuff. Um, anyway, so you have a, a few options for making simulators. I know other people use, uh, use other packages and, 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 and so on, but, but I would say the vast majority of simulators that I work with are done one of these three ways. 
Now it's worth pointing out when we do a simulator, we're making some assumptions, whether we realize it or not. Here's the here's some of the assumptions that we're making. We're we're as with any other form of survey research, of course, we're assuming that we've talked to the right people, the people who are in the market, the people who are actually whose choices actually matter. Um, we've assumed that uh, each each person is in the market to buy. These these are actively interested people, uh, so that they're making choices that are sort of realistic to them and, and not so much hypothetical. If you took a random survey of Americans and asked them about their retirement choices, uh, you know, 20 years, a 20 year old can tell you maybe something about their retirement choice, but you have to really doubt how reliable it would be. Uh, we have to assume that the respondents answers themselves, even assuming that we're talking to the right people and they're, they're in the market and ready to buy, we have to assume that their answers are, res are, are reliable, uh, which means if we gave them the same survey tomorrow, they'd answer more or less the same way, uh, and that the, the responses are valid, that they're telling us not only what's true, but also what's accurate of their behavior. We'd have to hope that, what the, the, that their answers in the survey reflect uh, the choices they would make in the real world. That would be, that would be a validity. That's what we, we're hoping to get out of our sample. We're assuming that we've used a proper measurement technique and, and, and matched it with an appropriate statistical model and, and for that matter with an appropriate simulation model. Uh, again, I mentioned that the logit choice simulator works if, you're, if you've got logit based utilities, utilities that came out of a, uh, a logit model of some sort. If for some reason you ran a regression model, an old fashioned ratings based conjoint ran a regression and plugged them into the logit choice rule, might not be that accurate. There's no reason it would be. And we're assuming that all the attributes that affect buyer choices in the real world have been included in our model and accounted for. If we've left something important out, our simulator might not be very accurate. And there's, there's other assumptions we're making as well. We're, we're assuming that all of the, uh, we're assuming essentially a level playing field in our simulator. All of our, all of our products that we're simulating, that we're building, that vanilla cone and that chocolate cone, are equally available, so they've got equal distribution. Uh, respondents are equally aware and familiar with all the products. I think most people are pretty pretty equally familiar with uh, with vanilla and chocolate, but you can certainly think of simulations where that might not be the case, where you're where one of the products is a new product to market that maybe not everybody's heard of. Um, we're assuming the, the simulator is giving us sort of an equilibrium level. Uh, a simulation where, where all the products have been on the market an equal amount of time. And again, in some markets, that's a little bit of an unrealistic assumption. There are first mover advantages, they're called, in some markets where the first brand to market uh, just gets the lion's share of, of sales. <clears throat> we have to assume that the sales forces, social media, and word of mouth marketing efforts are equally effective and that there's no out of stock, right? So in the, in the cone example, for instance, if chocolate had been out of stock, uh, the simulator wouldn't have been accurate unless we accounted for that out of stock. The neat thing is most of these assumptions right here are things we can we, that we, we've built into the newest uh, market simulator that's available. So uh, I think the third session in our uh, in our trilogy of simulator sessions, I think the second one is actually going to be a demo of, of, our, of our various uh, simulation softwares and then the third one is going to talk about some of the new features and so uh, that's coming, so sign up for those webinars if you want to learn more about those things. I mentioned earlier that we want to be careful not to, not to call our shares of preference market shares because again, there's all those things that, that were on the previous two pages, all those assumptions that may or may not be true. Uh, so, so all those ways in which we said the, the simulator reflects the real world, there, there could be some differences there. Of course, that doesn't mean that simulators aren't valuable. For one thing, we've got, we, we're able to turn those utilities that nobody understands into shares, and the, the simulators do predict what happens when we assume a level playing field. Of course, as marketers, we want to tilt that playing field. We don't really want it to be level, right? So to the extent that there are differences in awareness or distribution or, and, and so on, we can take those into account in our simulators. Again, that's something we'll be talking about in subsequent sessions. I want to talk a little bit about um, a topic that comes up sometimes. So, uh, we're able, it turns out that the logit, the, the logit model, um, the logit model is tunable. And what that means is 
we it's not, we assume uh, we, we don't need to assume that the the amount of error the amount of random noise that happened in our survey uh, is the same as the random noise that happens out there in the world so it's fairly common for people to tune their logit simulators and in effect what we're what, when we're doing tuning we're really just multiplying by a constant right so Let's take the three utilities we looked at earlier, the 0.75, the 0, and the 1.25 for our three imaginary products, A, B, and C. Uh, if, we don't, if we just multiply them all by one or just leave them all alone, we get the shares down there at the bottom of the page with, for the 1.0 multiplier. They'd be 62%, 29, and 8. But if we thought that there was a different amount of error in the real world than there is in our survey, maybe we think that our survey is just too clean. Um, if we think our survey is too clean and people are able to focus in a way that they're not able to focus in the real world, maybe we want to do, we want to use a multiplier something less than 1.0. Um, that would tend to flatten the shares out. In fact, in the extreme, you can see sort of an extreme example here, where we've said the multiplier is 0.01. You do you make a you know we've essentially made all the shares equal at about 33%. That's probably way too extreme. We, 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 that, that's essentially reflecting random behavior on our, on our respondents part. On the other hand, if we move the multi, if we make the multiplier larger, and here's an example at the bottom of the page where we made it 5.0, the larger that's, that, that multiplier gets, the closer our logit model is to a first choice model. In fact, it can become entirely deterministic if we make the, uh, the multiplier large enough. And, and you'd want to make your multiplier larger if you thought for some reason that there was more error in your survey than there is in the real world. Um, probably uh, what I usually see is, is things going the other way, that, that our surveys are a bit cleaner than the real world and that we want to use multipliers somewhat less than 1.0. 0.4 and 0.5 are common numbers that people use. And this just says the same thing in the words. The, the, the multiplier is something called a scale factor. In Sawtooth software, in our products, we call it the exponent. And again, as, as that scale factor gets larger, it becomes first choice. As it gets smaller, the shares flatten and become equal. Sometimes people want to, uh, want to tune their simulators based on, uh, because they realize that, uh, that the amount of love uncertainty in their questionnaire might be different than the uncertainty out there in the world. So uh, we can tune the simulator, you know, Ideally, we'd have some sort of market share information. If we had market share information, that would be a great way to tune our simulator. We could use it and say, oh, look, the shares that came out of our simulator are a bit too spiky. The lows are too low and the highs are too high. Let's dampen them down a bit by, 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 by using an exponent or a multiplier or a scale factor that's smaller than one. Let's try 0.7. Let's try 0.6. Let's try to match it up with those market shares. Sometimes we don't have market shares available and we like to we like to at least try to uh, scale our utilities so they work well with holdout choices. Um, sometimes people use holdout choices that are collected in the questionnaire. Uh, so each respondent provides holdout choices and estimation choices. There's really no reason that those utilities, are, you know, that 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 uh, that the scale in those holdout questions should be different when you've got the same respondents. I think it's a little bit better. If we have holdout choices made by a holdout set of respondents, and then we we adjust our scale factor to match those uh, sh those shares, it's a bit better. And again, that's what the exponent does. It's the same as multiplying by a constant. Last two topics here before we uh, we, we take questions, and this one comes up a lot. We've got uh, we've got the ability to interpolate, right? So. If, we, if we've got four price points in our survey, 10, 20, 30, and $40, we're not going to run into too much error if we interpolate even linearly between 20 and $30, right? No matter what the shape of that curve is, even if you, even if you, if you made that a little bit curvy instead of a straight line between 20 and 30, you're not going to be very far off. So interpolation is pretty darn safe to do uh, when we've got ordered attributes like price or you know length of warranty or you know just whatever whenever we've got uh, levels that are that are ordered in some way interpolation is pretty darn safe what's not safe is extrapolation because we've never measured the range beyond forty dollars 
I think it's it would be it would be unsafe and unwise to say, well, you know, whatever the slope of that line is between 30 and 40, let's just continue it out to $50 and $100 and $8,412. There's no real reason to believe that 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 makes a lot of sense. So we really have to be careful and advise our clients that it's really dangerous to do because we don't know. You've seen how steep the fall off is between 20 and 30, much steeper than it is between 10 and 20 or between 30 and 40. Uh, we don't know what happens after $40. Is it, a, is, it a, is it flat like it is between 30 and 40? Or is it a really steep fall off like between 20 and 30? Or does it go all the way down to zero? We don't really know. Okay. So th that's all the mechanics of simulations. I just wanted to point out that simulation isn't a f all by itself a forecast system. Oftentimes our forecast systems are much bigger than this and sh uh, simulating shares is just one little piece of it. So we might wanna be taking into account awareness and whether a customer is new to a market or they're an existing customer. Um, whether they, uh, you know, whether they're judge, you know, what sort of information they have that they're basing their judgments on, because that's different for people new in the market and existing customers. And even after the shares, we want to turn those shares into volumes, and we want to add it up for all of our customer segments. So this is a kind of a, a simple forecast system here. I've seen systems that have, you know, eight or ten different kinds of customers and different uh, simulators for each different kind of customer, and so on. And then lastly, I, I wanted to just end the, the presentation today with, with a bit of humility here. The, uh, earlier this year, The Economist uh, had kind of a neat report. Uh, they, they, they used IMF data. So the, the International Monetary Fund, they've got access to literally the best data in the world, uh, all of the country's economic data, right? And what they found is that 21 months out, using all of that, that you know, world-class, literally world-class data uh, that they could, you know, that when they predicted growth rates by country, they had a mean error of prediction of about 2.6 percentage points. Turns out that's better than a random number forecast, which was 4.3 percentage points, um, but not by a whole lot, right? So it's, it, it, you know, so using the best data in the world, they weren't able to get as, you know, to, to improve accuracy a whole lot beyond just picking random numbers uh, out of the air, which is a little bit disturbing. So we need to be careful um, and try to make our forecast as accurate as possible. We need to do our homework too and, and see if we can't even do better than that. Uh, and it, it turns out that forecast accuracy is going to improve as our simulators capture the market more realistically. So the more realistic we can make our conjoint experiments, the better. Um, we'd like our simulations to have enough sample size that give us precision, right? Because uh, sample size is the currency with which we buy precision in survey research. So if we have a sample of 100 people, our, 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 our share predictions are going to be roughly plus or minus 10%. That's, that's not really very accurate. Um, so, so that, that's that's uh, so so having large enough sample size is going to be helpful. We really need to understand more about the levers that drive sales and shares, so that we can build them into our forecast system. Um, we want, we, you know, we, we're going to have to realize that there's other components to the forecast system beyond the market simulation, and that we need to fill in the blanks so that we so that we we have as informed uh, information as possible about those uh, those other components. And th this, is, this is a great observation um, that, that an economist gave me one day. He said, you know, if we, if we have a, a really complicated forecast system, uh, that, that as long as the different pieces of that, as, as long as the inputs are independent and multiple and small, we can take advantage of the central limit theorem. It'll be our friend. It'll make our forecast more accurate because some of those small, some of those many small independent errors are likely to cancel out. So uh, a lot of times it's, it's helpful if we can pull our information from multiple sources rather than having all of the inputs to our forecast uh, come from the same survey. So we got conjoint utilities from the survey and reports of volume from the same survey and reports of this, that, and the other thing all loaded in from one survey. Uh, those aren't really independent. If we, if we could bring them from multiple sources, that would be helpful. And that's it. Ready for questions. Wonderful. Great job, Keith. Um, first one that comes in is, um, in your work, 
What proportion of your simulations have been first choice versus share of preference versus randomized first choice? Ah, good question. Um, I would say 20, 40, 40. <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that, that's actually a, about right. I mean, first choice, it does apply sometimes, um, but, but it doesn't apply that often. On the other hand, I've used it sometimes when I had um, when I had also, when, when I had substitution patterns that I couldn't model well with logit, and I had really large sample sizes, uh, I, I would go with first choice. But but usually I'm I'm using logit um, or randomized first choice. Great, thanks. Um, a question about your extrapolation slide. So I imagine that some of our customers have tested attributes that um, maybe have initial interval scaled inter, um, data, so you know, 100, 200, 300, but then they have maybe an unlimited as the um, final level, right? It's this uncapped, unlimited level. How do you handle that, uh, especially when you're thinking about drawing this, this curve function? Well, actually, I, I would think it looks a lot more like this. I would think that if unlimited is one of the levels, uh, as long as we have a utility for unlimited, uh, we can go up to, unli you know, well, yeah, we, we can, you're right, how do we interpolate? <laughs> how do we inter yeah, you're right, if, if, this is, uh, if this is the amount of minutes on a, on a cell phone plan, right. we've got, you know, 10 free hours or 20 or 30 or 40 free hours or unlimited, um, how do you, that, that's a really good question. I think you'd have to come up with some kind of assumption about, uh, about what that unlimited was. You, you, I, I guess on occasion I've, I've I've looked at what the highest plausible value is, and then tried to tried to do it that way. Mm -hmm. But um, that that is a tough one. I, I'd be really curious to to hear if someone had a really good way of doing that. Yeah, very interesting. Um, great question that came from the crowd. Um, how about when you talk about estimating the data? One thing that comes up is interaction effects. So if you include interaction effects in your model, can you talk about how that impacts the actual design of the simulator? Oh, the, uh, if you've included them in your model, you want to build them into your simulator too. So you'll have a utility for each interaction effect, right? And as, as long as your simulator tracks when that interaction effect would apply, you put it in your simulator and it's, it's just another additive effect that gets put in uh, to the total utility of a product. So the total utility of a product is its, its main effect utilities, all you know the utility for each level of each attribute in that product, plus those interaction utilities insofar as they apply to that product. Mm -hmm. Great. It's just another additive effect you put in there. Great. Um, so for randomized first choice and the background that went into it, was this based on theory or an actual model, taking the multiple iterations per respondent, taking that leap from a share of preference logit rule model? Hmm. Theory or a model. I'm not sure I understand the distinction between a theory and a model. What what it is, it's 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 a it's a mathematical way of trying to do at the respondent level, uh, kind of what the logit model does, but in such a way that that it allows the errors to be correlated like a probit model would. So I guess you could say it's theoretical because because we're we're, we're trying to do we're trying to escape the IIA problem um, by by making the model probit like and so. So you could say that there's a theory there and, and a model because it's the probe, it's essentially like a probit model. Perfect. So I'd Thank say you. both. <laughs> Double <laughs> barreled. <laughs> All right, we still have time for I think one more question. Um, you had talked about tuning the exponent and getting your um, you know making adjustments to your shares. Let's assume that a respondent or um, an analyst included products that are currently on the market, right? And they can tune the exponent to make the shares of those products on the market look like actual market shares. Would you then refer to all of the shares as market shares or would you still hesitate and just refer to them as shares of preference? I would still call them shares of preference because there's still things that, so, 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 we, okay, so they're all existing products, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, we're not, and we're not adding any new products to the mix. We're just trying to model those existing products. I, I would just say that our shares of preference did a really good job of capturing market shares then or predicting them. I, I wouldn't say 
I, I might say that I've calibrated my predictions, uh, my, my shares of preference to be like the market shares, but I, wouldn't, I still wouldn't say they are the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, a photograph of a person can look a lot like that person, but it's not the same as the person. <laughs> Great example. Awesome. Well, I think that that's it. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. And as Keith mentioned, next week we will have our um, product demo of the new Market Simulator with Brian McEwen, same time, next Wednesday. If you'd like to join, please sign up, and it'll take you through a lot of the new features that um, Keith had pointed out in terms of how to handle product av availability, awareness, and distribution. And then from there, on March 16th, Brian Orm will give an even more in-depth um, talk to some of those advanced procedures, uh, which is available to our suite holders exclusively. So feel free to email me if you would like to be invited to the third one and you're a suite holder, um, and hopefully we will see you all next week. Thanks so much, Keith. Thanks, everyone.